So you know I am the queen of learning from experiences and my whole life has been I think quite painful some parts and what I've tried to do is develop a better way of managing myself and managing my journey and my story and not letting it define me. So I've joined a most wonderful woman to join me because she's going to talk about the pain that she endured some years ago but that's the way that it's motivated her for change, motivated her to empower herself and she's turned her pain into purpose. So I would like to welcome Charlene, also known as Shasha PR. That's her <laughs> handle. Charlene, thank you for coming to join me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having so me. So we are going to talk about the major, most painful episode that you had in your life. If you can give us like a brief summary, if you can even make it brief, about the devastating incident that happened to you. Okay, well, um, I'll start off by saying um, my parents met young teenagers in love nice um had me young age i think they were both like 17 oh wow um they planned me as well imagine oh, nice. yeah <laughs> they, they were in love like head over heels anyway i came along um they 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 did split when they were quite young my mom yeah. moved to london my dad stayed in liverpool that's where i was born okay and um but i've always had always had a great relationship with my dad he was always the peaceful parent yeah. the most peaceful parent um obviously love mum yeah. won't come for me <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> but um yeah as a um, yeah my childhood it you know it was quite um let's say it was colorful yeah colorful childhood and there was lots going on um and but my dad was always that peace that okay. side of peace so um when I was like how old was I 27 um, I'd remembered, I'd spoken to my dad, maybe the fry, maybe the Friday. Um, he was coming to collect, um, to build my wardrobe for me. So we made plans. Then I got a call on the mon- on the m- Monday following that Friday, um, from one of my little cousins crying saying, Uncle Julian's dead. Um, so I just, we talking about like don't be silly we've got plans uncle julian's my dad yeah and my dad's not dead yeah Yeah. he's coming to build my wardrobe right and i i remember that moment i remember being at home this happens in south london um i'm at the time living in hackney and i remember i just went into a weird space like i wasn't crying i wasn't anything at the time my space showing my age i was on my space at the time i used to blog a lot okay and i remember the first thing i done i went on my space and I think I I put something like they killed my dad. So this is just after the phone. This call. is just yeah, as they said it. And I wasn't crying. I was just in this weird space, like. And who were they? When you say they killed your dad, they well, I don't. I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> I just know that he'd been killed. Right. So at that at that point, all that had happened was um, he had been killed. Um, the air ambulance came, tried to revive him, couldn't. Right. So that's all I knew at that point. So then I made my way down to where he had died, um, trying to find out information. It was, you know, lots of people around. So obviously we have no idea what's happened. Then I I just went into overdrive. I was very much, um, I was into events at the time. I was promoting raves. I was doing a lot of media stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just ended up, I sent emails out because we were looking for who who did it. It was one of them who done it. I don't even know if I cried at this point. I just went into... So what was what was the mode of injury? How did he die? Right. So how he died, he was stabbed. He was stabbed, um, I believe, 18 times. In broad daylight? In his home. In his home, in South London. In his home. So someone, was there forcible entry? Did someone have... En- what were the police saying at this time? Right. So, well, we got the whole story when it went to trial. When they right. did... The, the men, they got the men. Basically, there were seven men that were arrested. Right. Um, and what had happened, the, the story in short was, um, there was a young guy, 17 year old, who had been selling drugs or doing what he was doing. I think maybe he didn't want to do it anymore, tried to get away. And the people who he was working with came for him, beat him up in his house, which happened to be on the same road as my dad's road where my dad was living. So he had two brothers who very violent, very well known, white as well. Um, to go and tell them I've been beaten up by these guys, etc. So, you know, my little brother, they're coming to deal with whoever's beating right. up my little brother. So they're on a rage. They're making phone calls, phoning their friends, trying to gather up some people to go after these people who have attacked their brother. 
So they've, they've done all of this. They've made all the plans, all the, you know, it all came out in the, in the trial, what had happened and what they had planned. They had got all the knives together. They, you know, they, this was a big thing that they were about to go and do. So they've gone to the road. They're asking him, what, what door is it? Where, which one, which one? The boy didn't really know. He just said it was a blue door. It's a blue door. He lives at a blue door. On this particular road. On this particular road. And how many blue doors are on this road? (laughs) It's a mixture. (laughs) So they, they, first. So these boys' brothers. Yeah. Have now gone to seek retribution Mm -hmm. for the harm that their little brothers endured. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for a blue door on a road. Yeah. That your dad lives, but also that someone else that was involved in that lived. Yes. Right. that, That was the big plan. So they actually first knocked on the door next door to my dad or banged on the door. So the person upstairs looked downstairs and I think they could see that there were knives and stuff. So the first thing they done was call the police because they're right. like, what's, what's this? And then it was like, no, no, wrong door. Cause that was heard. No, it's not this one. It's the next one. So they've gone next door to the next door, looked in the window, seen a silhouette of a black man, my dad, and said, there he is. The, all you can tell is that it was a black man. Jeez. Um, but the person who they were looking for was like the same kind of age as them. But your dad is my dad their age. Was, no, no, no. But he's quite small in stature. Okay. So imagine this is, um, he doesn't take days off work. But this week he decided to take the week off for a break. So he's in his house. This is about two o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday. Um, so they're like, there he is. So then they start kicking down the door. Um, you know, like terraced houses, some houses you've got like two, fl- one downstairs, one upstairs. Yeah, yeah. So they've managed to bust through the f- main door. So yeah. then my dad's come to the door like, what's, what's yeah, all yeah, this yeah. noise? So before, well, I think he got to open the door and they've just rushed into him. And I think there was a fight mm. at first. Because obviously he's defending himself. Yeah, he's defending himself. you've got man at my door trying to obviously showcase knives and violence. All right, out of nowhere. So he's fighting for his life, basically. And he managed to be stabbed 18 times in that kerfuffle. No one can see his face to know, oh, is this, oh, it's not the right guy. Let's go. There was none of that. There was just 18 times. And there was only, I think, two men actually entered that room. So for 18 stabs and only two, it might have been three. It's a bit blurry. But, um. I don't understand. And yeah, they left him, they left him for dead. Um, at that time, my younger cousin had, had gone to the shop. So your younger cousin was at your dad's? Left to go to the shop, and when he come back, when he's come back, this is what he's seen. So that's when you got the phone call. I got the phone call. No, even a bit after that, I think he went into shock because um, I got the call from his one of what well, basically we're all cousins. So he must. I don't know. The, there must have been loads of calls going mm. around because it was. It, I didn't get the call from him, but I do know that air ambulance came and tried to save him, but they couldn't save him. Well, I mean, for me. <laughs> This seems like something out of a movie. Yeah. Because it feels too random and too, too strange. Was your dad involved in crime, criminal activity? Was he known for it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He, Bustafarian, everything's peace and love. And do you know what I mean? He was at carnival every year cooking his jerk. And do you know what I mean? That was him. He was... That was it. He used to dance. He used to have a sound back in the day, in his young days. He was the peaceful person. He was even um, somebody, even like the young people knew him, like they come and talk to, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like he's like the reason. uncle. That's what I'm saying. He was that guy. Do you know what I mean? Do you, I mean, I'm all for taking the good out of the bad. Mm. And I can imagine it took you a long time mm, mm. to get to that point, or even this point where you can sit down, talk about it. What was your journey, your mental journey like when you know you've lost your dad now? Is hate the first thing that you felt? It's so strange because in the, in the, um, during the trial, I was at the trial almost every day. It was nine weeks. And how long after the incident was the trial? It was quite a long time, a good few months. Okay. Like we couldn't bury him for like two months after he died. Um, what, because they were looking for cause of death? Because it was, I don't know. I, I, there's so many things that I'm just like, nothing makes sense. Yeah. So many things that were just very and that, strange. in terms of closure in itself is really challenging. Yeah. Because you've got, you, you know, having experienced a funeral for a parent, that does, um, 
for the sake of a better word, put the nail in the coffin. Mm. It does it does give you that sense of ending and closure. Yeah. But you can't have that. Yeah. And then you've got a trial mm. to bring up things that you don't know. Yeah. Then you're hearing about every injury, where every injury was. Are they showing pictures as and well? They, they weren't showing pictures, but they were, you know, they had the professionals that would explain, you know, there was one in particular one that went through his hand, which shows defence. You know, they could explain, yeah. they can literally see what was happening by where the injuries were. One that went through his face, like... Yeah. And the thing is, I think for me, you are his daughter. Mm. And so you're sitting in this trial. Did, did you ever feel that, you know, you shouldn't have been there? Do, do you feel that you needed to hear or everything? I don't know. In a way, I felt like, because I, I was looking in the, the killer's faces every day as well. And that's it. So it was almost like, I felt like I just needed to look in their face. And what did you hope that looking in their face would do? Did you think it would make them feel guilty? Um, I just need, I felt like I needed to see remorse. Did you see remorse? In the people that did it? No. Mm. Um, there was a guy that was, um, acquitted and I, I believe he had nothing to do with it. Okay. I, and he, I think on his way out, I think he saw maybe my nan or one of my aunts and tried to say sorry, but everyone was so angry that weren't hearing nothing from no one. Mm. But it's weird when they were having this anger, I didn't have that same feeling. Mm. It's like, I could see this boy. I was looking at him. I'm like. He never wanted this. Like, he wasn't here for this. Do you know what I mean? They kind of just dragged him along for the ride. And when you say boy, they were what, in their 20s? They were, well, the the one of the brothers, the youngest brother was 17. I think the oldest out of the bunch was 21 at the time. So these are kids. And what did you want from that trial? I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, you know, it even took me a little while to accept that he was gone. Like, I, I would still phone his phone, mm. which would still ring. And what, get through to his voicemail and talk to him? Or it was just... just, no, I don't even think it went to a voicemail. It would just, I remember I tried to, I had two phones at the time. I remember when, before, when he died, I had two phones. I had one, like, was my personal number. And I had another, you know, selling tickets for mm. club events and stuff. Um, and he paid for one of them. Like, he was that dad. He paid for everything. <laughs> so, um, you know, he paid for one of the, so, Obviously, because he's died now, I was like, you know, when you start to try and sort papers out and all this stuff. And I remember phoning the company to say, look, my dad's died. He was paying for it. How can I transfer it? So it comes to me or whatever. And it was almost like they were trying to get information from me just in case I was involved in the thing. It just got really weird. I'm like, whoa, like, guys, this is my dad. This not. But I mean, I get it. They don't know, innit? They're just thinking, who's this person? This this phone is addressed to this person who's been murdered. And, you know, so. Anyway, there was, um, I think the main thing that bugged me about the whole situation was that where he was living, it was actually my aunt's house, his sister, where he hadn't been living for long. He moved in with her um, after a fallout with his partner or whatever. So he was staying with my aunt for a little while. So my aunt was made homeless, basically. Because of the incident that took place. Yeah. So she was made homeless her children had to go and live with their dad at the time. She had to move in with my nan. However, the families of the murderers were put into protection in case my family retaliated. I was like, wow, these people are mad. So, first question on my mind is, is that a racial move? Is it because they were white and they protected them? And because you guys were black, they made you endure? This is the thing. And I am I always try to make that the last thing. I don't want to say, oh, it's because I'm black. I really tried, but I couldn't find make any sense of it. Because if they saw my family, like we'd be, we'd ram out the court most days because everyone wants to be there. Everyone loved this man. So where we couldn't be in an actual court, like to be in the court, maybe like four or five members. Mm. So a lot of the time I was up in the gallery with their families, the murderers' families wow. and stuff. So I'm sitting next to them. No, no, no. How right? is that for you? It's mad because you can't, you've got to be silent and you're sitting there and you can hear some of them murmuring and what, when they don't really know the story, murmuring like, oh, they were probably in drugs anyway, making all comments. Like one of my uncles got thrown out because... You know, I don't, you know what? That is a different level of strength for me because you're sitting next to the, the family members of the people that killed your dad and you are sitting there enjoying that every single day. 
Yeah. All of that. I lo- I can't remember where I was working at the time. I know I lost my job or I left or one or the other. So I'm there nine weeks, you know, unemployed, not really knowing what's happening financially because I need to be there. What you're 27. And it's like, yeah, and it's like a, it's a full-time job because you're in the court nine to five. And are you a mother at this point? No, no. But I'm the eldest of six of his children. So at that point, are you stepping up to have a role in your siblings' life to support them? And did you feel that you had to put on a brave face? Yeah. That was the case. And um, I definitely felt that way. I, well, I've got two brothers that are just after me. Um, they, they have a different mum. And then I have three younger sisters. So my baby sister was like seven months when oh. he died. So it did take a toll on the other two sisters. Um, one was 14 at the time. She's quite she's welly she's got a very um very opinionated Mm -hmm. she's quite rowdy sometimes Mm. and um that's how she reacted Mm. you know fights girl gangs etc she kind of went that way the other one is a little bit more like me she's a bit more quiet Mm. she just went into herself which to me was worse because I didn't know what she was thinking yeah yeah yeah. so it was very much I had to be there I had to make sure they were okay so in a way, it helped me because I just thought, as long as I've got that to focus on, I can keep moving. But then when do you grieve? Way later. <laughs> do you really think you've grieved? And how many years has um, it been now? Oh, gosh, it happened in 2007. Yeah. Have so you grieved yet? No. However, PDS- PTSD popped up literally maybe like two years ago. And what did that look like? That looks like... <clears throat> When I'd find I'd have maybe like an anxiety attack or something, there's been situations where I'd be walking past the house and it will sound like someone's fighting Mm. and I will panic. Yeah. Or um, a friend of mine had her house robbed and her explaining, because she was in the house when some people climbed through her window, very horrific. So when she's explaining it and I'm even picturing this happening, men rushing in her house. And then how how can you feel safe in your own house? You know, does it manifest in that way that you sit in your house and you you hear a noise or does that not ever happen? You know what? That didn't. I feel like it went the opposite way. I think what happened to me was if I go out at night and I'm walking street at two o'clock in the morning going to from a friend's or whatever and people are like, it's late at night, it's not safe. My response was, it's not safe 2 2 p.m. in your house. Mm. That was my response. So whatever's going to happen out here at this time. What do you think is the... um, the reasoning, because I, I am a true believer. Yeah, I mean, we both have religious relationships or relationships with God, mm. and I th- and one of mine is that everything happens for the way that it was supposed to happen, that it was ordained. How do you swallow that pill? How do you take, and do you have that opinion that your dad was meant to go when he was supposed to go? Um, yeah, I, I wrestled with it for a long time. Mm. Um, as a believer, you do the wise. You know, I've been good. What did I do? Was it me? Blah, blah, blah. You do all of that. You question, you have these conversations. Um, And I tried to make sense of it. And then like, I started to think about Jesus, literally like how he was sacrificed to Mm. save so many. Yeah. And as much as I don't think of my dad as Jesus, it was like only after he died, that made me want to help young people. Right. So there was young people like my sisters who Mm. were, 14 and 12 at the time and what was happening with them there was no one to help them Mm. professionally like there's me but I'm mourning their mum was mourning you know so I looked for organisations of anyone that could help at that time there wasn't there was one organisation you know I I got membership to find out what they were about got their magazines there's nobody that looks like us in this Mm, magazine mm, mm. they're going on retreats in the countryside they're you know with Sally and the, no, Sarah. no, no, no. <laughs> my sisters are not going to be yeah. involved in any of that. I'm like, there's no one to help us. And even with counselling, I think they might offer you counselling, maybe, maybe in the court. I don't even remember if it happened, mm. but apparently it did. They asked, do you need help? At that time, all I'm interested in is this court case. Yeah. And black people were like, Tch. yeah, because <laughs> you know, typically that's not what we do. Yeah, um, and we don't seek therapeutic help, and even though it's necessary, and and you're right. A few sessions is not going to help because some of these things, as you said, manifested years later and they may manifest again in another form. Um, And I wonder how we move forward to help children that have 
had murdered parents because if you if you think about it there are so many murders and harm a significant mm. harm that's happened in our community and it, it, it's what happens to the ones that are left mm. and I wonder if we remember and we help those that are left and I wonder how we can take stories like yourself to build and support organizations that need to make differences and need to make changes because that's the future and I'm not saying that the person that has died is needs to be forgotten but it's the remnants of that. And yeah. how do we heal those that have been significantly hurt? Because, you know, that that's some, not only did your dad die, but he was taken from you in such a tragic way. Mm. What was the penalty that was placed on those that were charged? Um, well, my, well, one's actually about to go for um, probation. Um, he's got probation hearing next month. So he could actually be walking free. Um, mad. It's it's mad. Basically, at the time, I think life sentence was fifteen years, and then and what you serve half? No, oh, that do? was a minimum. Okay. Um, but there was another young boy, white boy, that was killed very soon after, and because his sister, Ben Ben Kinsella, Ben Kinsella, right? So. And, you know, all the marches, I was probably on every march. Yeah. I didn't see the point in marching, but I felt like I had to do something, yeah. <laughs> you know. So I was out marching, doing all this stuff. Um, and when Ben Kinsella was killed, that's when they started to look at the law and they changed the death sentence. So not death sentence, it's a life sentence to 25 years. Right. So it's only because of Ben Kinsella why that happened. And he's a white boy yeah, of yeah, a yeah. famous white woman. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad it happened, but... Yeah. So because our case happened, if, if, if this thing happened two years later, they would have got 25 years. So now they've got 15 and the first person is about to come out. He got actually got 14. Then I think there was a 15 and a 16, but they're all, they've like, I've even had to write a statement, um, just a couple of weeks ago to be read out at the hearing. And in America they do, and I don't know if they do it here. They do work that you meet. Um, those that have harmed your loved mm. ones. Would you take part in something like that? Um, Would you I used meet to think the, about the, that. Uh, the those that have been acquitted of your dad's murder? Acquitted is that the right word? Charged. Acquitted. Charged. Yeah. Charged, yeah. Um, and speak to them and try to understand them and get their story. No, because I, I already feel like I understand. How do you understand? I don't. Under, I don't. Not understand. Under, not understand and approve, but understand. The foolishness, basically. It was revenge. It's someone's attacked your little brother. You're the big brothers. I need to go and make sure that but I do I need that. to go with knives to harm? That you went with knives, right? plural, These to were cause criminals significant already. injury. Yeah. You didn't just go to thump up a man mm. that just ended up with a bad blow that made him have a brain hemorrhage, then mm. he died. You went to give significant harm to a person. Mm -hmm. So how do you understand that? Yeah, there's well, no, there's not understanding. It's more um, they're criminals anyway. If they're going to hurt, they're going to do the most. Um, they they're going to do the most harm. From when I heard about who they were beforehand, you know, they've done time before. They've, yeah. do you know what I mean? They're that they're big guys. Do you know what I mean? So this is just them. If they go to get revenge on anyone, that's the length that they'd go to. How have you changed this pain into purpose? I've changed it. I think there were three things. And, and what, the reason why it was about the youth was because of who my dad was and how, you know, the local youth knew my dad as, you know, the guy to come and talk to and mm. that kind of thing. Then there was my little sisters who didn't really have any support knowing how to deal with their grief. Then, then there's the actual murderers. They, at one point, they were cute little boys. Mm. They were cute little boys that probably said please and thank you. And it's like, what part did they, what, what mm. moment was it that they turned into these people? So it's like, it's like nipping it in the bud because nobody wants to think they're little. No one looks at their four year old and think he could grow yeah, up yeah, yeah, and be yeah. a murderer. No one. You would never in a million you years. You don't want that. You don't even, nah. You would never think of that. All you're thinking about is I hope no one harms them, but you don't think, I hope you don't grow up uh, to be a murderer or an abuser or, but people don't think about that. Mm. It could be your child. They could grow up to be a murderer or an abuser. So it's about 
getting to them early. It's not about, oh, we've got to help teenagers. What about the children? Like get to them at that age to stop them from taking that turn. So in my mind, it's just the youth in general, just they need a lot. I know a lot of people want to help and, you know, you hear things all the time, but um, I did actually start, and I'm still building um, an organisation um, called um, Mango Treehouse, which um, Mango was my dad's nickname. Oh, nice. So, you know, I didn't want to name it after his name because I feel sometimes mm. it, I didn't want to make it too personal yeah. to him. But Mango is his nickname. So I usually do, yeah. man- yeah. you know, I've got a couple Mango companies. <laughs> but um, nice. Yeah. And the Treehouse is basically um, like the place for young people that they, it's just for them. So the Mango Tree House, in my mind, is a place where young people who have similar experiences, who have lost people in a violent way, mm. can speak to each other. Because I feel like that's yeah. where they speak. You know, young people, they don't normally like to conversate with adults. You know, it's like they'll, they'll shut peer down. Peer, and, yeah. yeah, so peer and peer, I think a lot of conversation needs to be had with each other because that's when they open up and sometimes just speak in it. Yeah. And um, even though I haven't even got this thing up and running properly as yet, people recommend people to me all the time nice. that sometimes they just want to talk. And I'm like, I'm here. I can talk. You know what I mean, sometimes you just want to talk. Mm. You know, I, I have a friend who um, is around the same age as me. His dad was killed in the same way. Wow. And he wouldn't speak to anybody about it. So where I was always, I was, I'm a singer as well. So People would always ask me, oh, can you come and sing at this anti-knife crime event? And I'd be like, oh, all right, cool. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I was everywhere, just yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. I can do. And, you know, I asked him, oh, do you want to come with me? To He didn't want to do nothing. He didn't want to speak to nobody. He was like Shut opposite down. to me. Yeah. Um, but one day we got talking and he just talked and talked and talked and talked. And I feel like he just needed that release. So I feel like that's a lot of people might just need that. Yeah. So how do we take Mango Treehouse to the next level? Like there must be people out there that have what you need what do you need to take it to that point that it's going to reach the masses um I think what I am interested in is partnership I mm. want to partner with other youth organizations okay. because I think there are so many everyone tries to do their own little yeah, ones yeah, yeah, and you've got yeah. all these little ones dotted around they don't have funds they don't have these things and then you have the really big organizations who don't know how to reach the yeah. right people they've got the money but they don't know how to re- when you look at their websites and stuff it's everyone going you know, they're swimming in cold water. Yeah, 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 they're yeah, doing yeah. all that That's foolishness. That's not for me. So, right. So <laughs> the nah. people that they need to nah. be reaching are here. They're like they're in Peckham, they're in Hackney. They're in, they're the, they need to be working together. And I, I'm more about working together rather than separating off and doing my own little thing. So it's more about um, partnerships and, you know, all these kids that have their school friends that have been stabbed. Mm. What happens to them? They don't get counselling. It's only immediate family. So when you're having to go to school and the girl that sit, sat ne- used to sit next to you, she was stabbed, then what happens to them? And I'm, and I'm thinking of you as a black woman who is trying to do this. How important it is, is it for our black men to be more active? I have this big gripe about <laughs> baby fathers or stepdads or whatever, really stepping up mm-hmm. and being there for our children. Yeah. What What's your, your views on men in our society oh well (laughs) I don't I mean I don't man bash and the thing is I don't I I don't have children so I don't have that pain of having a man leave and neglect his children although I've heard it over and over Mm. and over again um one thing I strongly believe in is mentorship so I believe there's a lot of men who they might be fathers they might not be but I feel like every single man should be mentoring at least one young person Honestly, because the, the lessons, because I, I think every child needs a father figure. Yeah. 100%. Um, as you said, whether it be a father that, that is a father or not, but a male role model, mm-hmm. it is imperative that we have that. And I was just thinking about even today, the influences even of our adult men. Sadly, you know, DMX passed away this week and I wonder the influence of drugs on his life. You know, he was a big man. Yeah. And still using drugs. It reminds me that we're still being challenged as a community. There's still so much going on that we don't understand. There's every platform. There's Instagram. There's Snap. There's TikTok. But there's there's something missing. Mm. There's something that's lost in souls that is not being addressed. And I don't know if it's... No, I think I know what it is. It's love. I don't think we love each other enough. I don't think you love eat a life enough not to knock on someone's door and harm them because they were troubling your brother. Mm. There, there is a lack of love. I think there is a, a lack of racial love. I yeah. still think we are massively divided in 
the black and the white love. No matter what people are saying that we love each other, and it's missing. It is that. I was literally in a in a clubhouse room this morning um, about um, stop Asian hate. And I don't usually go into Asian rooms because you, no, you see black I've people never... and you go to black people, wouldn't it? That's... Yeah. <laughs> and for some reason, I thought... So tell me about this Asian hate, actually. I'm re- I've seen it and I'm actually going to hold my hand up that I am really ignorant to it. That's how, exactly how I felt. I felt so bad because I went in and I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. What have I missed? Yeah. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of Asian people being killed. I believe it's happening in America. Right. Um, And the, what I noticed amongst this, you know, loads of Asian people in the room. I did see a few black people in there as well listening. And what I noticed is that they always mention the black community as well. Mm. And I'm like, when I'm in rooms talking about black people, we don't mention mention anyone else. But ourselves. And I'm like, wow, okay. Because they were mentioning us too. They were like, yeah, because the Asian community and the black community. I'm like, they actually think about us too. We don't think about it because one of their issues is that they're invisible. And I'm like, I, I see that. I hear that. They're invisible. We don't wow, think about them. We and don't. I'm like, well, I felt bad. I was listening. And I'm like, boy. But you know, and you know what? The thing is, I was I was noticing this week as well. There's this big drive to change the BAME title. Yeah. What's your views on that? I'm glad. Right. Why are you glad? Because it's black and Asian minority ethnics. Yeah. No, yeah. But um, black and Asian, black Asian and minority, minority ethnics. ethnics. Right. Why would? Why do you think it's necessary to change that title? Because it gives, I think it gives companies an excuse not to say black okay. when there's a black issue happening. Um, for example, somewhere where I worked when um, the George Floyd thing was happening and we've got an office in New York and there was something mention, mentioned in communication and he, there was not one word of black in that email. It was, he used BAME and I thought, this isn't anyone else's problem. Yeah. I just thought, don't bunch us together because we're not, we're not fighting the same fight right now. Right. Is and it, right it gives now? them then, an excuse. But to, then I wonder if, is it a contradiction of what we've just said that the Asian people would think of us, mm. but then there's times that we want to be separate to them. Yeah, but it's not just Asian. When it says um, black, Asian and minority, okay. that includes travellers, that includes Irish, that includes, ah, so it's like, we're yes. not all, we're not all together. Oh, it's true. You know, I didn't think of that. There's them. all these other, there's, you've got, I don't know, the Turkish people that are here. You've got, yes. every, basically it means everyone that's not white. That's what that means. Everyone that's not white English, because they don't use it in any other country. It's only UK. So anyone that is not English, that's what they means. Why do we use it only in the UK? I'm not being because fun. in in America they call it they've got BIPOC, which is black. Oh gosh, I can't remember. Indig- indigenous yes. because they've got the in- uh, native yes, they Indians. Do. So they use BIPOC the way that we were using BAME. And and I wonder did that incident with your dad encourage racism within you did you look at white people differently i didn't i can't didn't. say that i did i really can't i really rate you you know because you see me i'm not I'm even not, gonna lie the thing is i would understand Ooh. anyone thinking that way i i definitely would because um, you targeted my dad as you clearly said yeah he looked through the window and you saw a black man yeah Because you know what it is? I see it as the, I, I always see it as the people. These are the people that did it. Mm. I can't say white people because yes. I know it's not all white people. And that mm. would affect me yeah. every, every time I interact with a white person, which is every single day of my life. Yeah. And I, I can't live like that. That's, it was more about me and my way of finding peace. And one of the things I feared the most when you mentioned earlier about meeting um, the murderers, one of the things I feared the most was them apologizing to me because I call myself a Christian. So I'm supposed to forgive. Ooh. So the thought of me forgiving, I said, I actually don't want them to apologize to me because I don't want to have to. So, so I tried to just push that aside. I just didn't want to think about okay, it. Okay. Okay. So let's think about it now. If they apologize today, are you forgiving? I believe that I would, because I know that I'm supposed to, I believe it will be very, very difficult. However, I have been looking out for signs of remorse and there's been no communication that there has been. Usually we get, we get notified about everything they do when they're in prison, when they appeal for this appeal, they're always trying something. And, um, there's been no evidence. But you don't want fake remorse remorse either. No, I don't want you to write a letter and say how sorry you was when you wasn't. Yeah. Especially if it's something to help you get out quicker. I don't, don't, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. The only person I felt some kind of 
feeling for was the person who got remitted during the trial mm-hmm. when they, they said he's got nothing to do with it. So he wasn't actually charged. They actually let him go. What is forgiveness to you? For- forgiveness is not even about the other person. It's about freeing yourself. I honestly believe that. And you don't even need to get, you don't need to get an, ap- uh, an apology to forgive somebody. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, to hate someone, it's, it's an action. So the longer you hate someone, your body's actually using energy to hate somebody. Mm-hmm. So I'm using energy every day to be hating someone. Yeah. And that wasn't what your dad was about. That's not, he wasn't, he wasn't about that. So he, he would have been that. going against everything that he stood for. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't just, I can't hate. That takes up too much unnecessary energy. So I have to use that energy in another way. I just have no idea what I'd do if they came to me and said, I'm really sorry for what I did. Yeah. I wouldn't know what I would do either. I think that, I think that's one of those things that you have to be there. <laughs> you know, you yeah, just Yeah, I'm like, to... I, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, they, they, not too long after that they had a, I remember looking for them online and I found them on Facebook. And I remember just looking at it. I didn't send a message. I didn't do anything. I was just looking at them smiling in their pictures with their children and, just like, oh, mate. and then now, should one be released, you're going to look again, aren't you? And I'm going to feel, well, they're not, no, they disappeared after a while. Okay. But I, I'll be, I'll be pre in everything to see how you're living now. Yeah. What I th- do think about is bumping into them on the street because they're from Brixton. So they're, you know, or my, my, a lot of my family live in South London. So it's, it's bumping into, because I know their faces, like I can see their faces all, all times. So if I go into a shop and there's someone standing next to me and it's. And do they know your face? Um, yeah, they would have, yeah. They, and you're a public figure. They would know, but yeah, I'm, it's easy to find me. So. And are you afraid for your life? Um, I'm not afraid because it's something I believe in. It's, it's hard to explain. I'm not afraid because if it was a thing where they were to come for me or whatever, not, I just know it's about my dad and I'll fight to the death. Do you know what I mean? But I'm, af- I'm afraid for my family. And how they feel, how my sisters feel. Um, all of my sisters have gone to counselling. Um, I've been to counselling. My aunt's gone to counselling. Like my dad, they were like best friends. Um, you know, my, my, my nan, um, got cancer very soon after he died. Um, stage four cancer. She's still alive. Wow. She's been fighting all this time. Wow. So their prison sentence, even when they get out, we're still serving that prison sentence. They don't, they don't deserve to be out. They don't deserve. And I, and I, and I think you lose your privilege when you take another person's life. Absolutely. Um, and I, I want to wish you the peace of mind that you need to live your very best life in spite mm. of your pain. And I will do whatever I can to encourage you and to support your project because I believe in it. Mm. And no matter how, what, avenue or network I'm on please shout me let me know how I can do this because I really believe that children well you know children and young people are my core it's my profession um and those that have lost in such tragic circumstances and I I want to hug the child in you that Mm. is mourning for their daddy you know because I don't think that mourning ever ends yeah so but I want to thank you for sharing your story Thank you so much for having me. Can oh, can I sh- can I shout our XLP project? You can. It's a youth project that I actually volunteer with. Nice. They have mentor. They do mentorship for young people. Love so that's how I got into that. I mentor young girls. The men mentor young boys. Um, they're always looking for mentors. So nice. If you're out there and a- you XLP project, because you, you don't need to be anything other than yourself you to be a mentor. You don't need to be qualified. All you need to do is just really want to help someone and just be an ear to listen to somebody. That's all. And most of us have got two ears, right? So and a mouth. <laughs> that's it. So let's do this. That's it. Just be a decent person. Just that's, be a that's decent the only person. qualification. Charlene, we love you. Aww, Thank you for winging it with us. Me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.